good morning, guys. Uh, to start things off, I did not let myself, but it's actually raining outside. <laughs> so uh, if you see me shaking, uh, it might be cold, so I'm nervous. But that's besides the point. <laughs> um, let's see. Today I'm going to start off by uh, telling a story. I'm going to call it the abridged story of Logan Barrow. Uh, once upon a time, Logan Barrow was a short, scrawny little boy who really enjoyed Star Wars and video games. And you would think, that's OK. Kids do that nowadays. But uh, early 2000s, if you were like that, you were kind of picked on by the, uh, the sport kids and the, uh, the redneck kids. And so little scrawny Logan was often running for his life. Yeah, kind of like running away from lions as a lamb. You know, you go to school, there's a bunch of big lions. They like come in their name. Flexing their teeth or whatever, you don't flex teeth, just go on. <laughs> <laughs> and you, know, you would try to fit in and mind your own business, but because you're a lamb, they see you and they know you're easy picking. And so, life was a little hard as a kid. Uh, I had a few friends. A few. My best friend was actually about four years younger than me. And when you're in elementary school, it gets pretty weird. You know, you invite all your friends to your birthday party, which means a class, whether you're friends or not, it's no big deal. Uh, and your best friend comes in and he's like in kindergarten learning about the letter M and you're in like fifth grade learning division. It's fine. Um, it, it became really hard to maintain confidence when every day was ridicule and your best friend was so much younger than you that he couldn't quite relate to clothes. And over time it only became worse. I think we can all agree that middle school is a rough time. And as time progressed, middle school became one of the worst periods of time in my life. Uh, throughout, throughout all this, I went to church. My dad, he was not ordained, but he spoke in church every now and then. And my mom led worship. So I knew to be good. I knew that God loved me and that he was in control of everything. But you know, I'm at that age where it doesn't quite click for me. And so I'm living the way I should. I'm thinking that if I do that, I'll be fine. But middle school, it just turned into a downward spiral. Uh, suicidal thoughts became a thing. Uh, I understand it can be kind of cliche. Almost everyone goes through a period in their life where there's uh, depression, you know. But uh, this is mine. This is what happened to me. Um, I would often think of myself as so insignificant and so unloved and so unimportant that I really didn't make any difference. That somehow God had made a mistake in creating me because I had done nothing for him but be ridiculed and disrespected. I had truly lost all sense of value. Uh, the one thing that really brought me back was when we discovered his new church. Uh, Parkway Wesleyan, actually. Some might know it, some may not. It's a Wesleyan church in Rhoda, pastored by uh, John. There, I met some people that helped me discover the new life we had in Christ. And I began to discover that God doesn't really make mistakes, and that everyone is here for a reason. And so the verse I'm working off of today is from Ephesians. It's chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So, God doesn't create anything because he has to. I believe that everything on earth was built because he wanted it to be there. And by that, I mean God wanted you, you specifically. He thought of you and thought you were so fantastic that he wanted you to be on this earth. He wanted you to exist. The fact that you are even here right now is a statement that he loved you so much he had to meet you. There is such incredible value behind that because our God is something so beyond comprehension. Bear with me. We know of him as you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I see those as translations of a being beyond comprehension. And the idea that a 
being such as him would degrade himself enough to be understood by people made from dust is incredible. That is love beyond description. And this beyond us being wanted us to exist, us and our imperfections, and us and our sin, us when we deny that we have value, when we deny the gift of life, when we deny that we have any sense of existence, any reason to be here, he still wanted us to be here. He wanted us to go through all that because he can love us and he can have a relationship with us. He also created you because he has a plan for your life. You hear that a lot. That's like everyone's go-to phrase when you're going through a hard time and it's like, hey, he has a plan for your life. I'm only slightly borrowing that from John Chris last week. Um, but it's true. Uh, I do believe that every single person in this room has their own unique path that God has set up for them. I'm not saying I'm a Calvinist and that it's just said, but I do believe that there is something you are meant to do, and that is why you are still here. I had a friend in high school. Her name was Gabby. Well, that's what we're going to say her name is. Gabby was a really sweet girl. She was really charismatic. She was smart, but she wanted to be. But she kind of hung out with the wrong crowd. She had a bad home situation, and naturally that led to these and drugs and alcohol. Gabby ended up in a relationship that wasn't good for her. It was, we'll keep it back. It was not good for her. A couple months later, she calls me on the phone and she says, Logan, I'm pregnant. I don't know what to do. We're juniors in high school at this point. And I tell her, you know, I haven't told anyone else. And she's like, no, I'm the first person, you're the first person I told. Wow, okay. Um, I told her she didn't get right with God. She needed to pray. You know, I'm giving the best advice that junior high school Logan can give at this point. Uh, a few months later, she called me again and says, Logan, I'm going to kill myself. Tonight is my last dinner, and I wanted you to know that. And so I'm frantically telling her, like, no, don't do it. You know, like, muster it up, whatever you can think to tell someone in that moment, because you know you have maybe 15 minutes with this person before they go on to make a decision that could potentially end their life. And so I'm scrambling towards an awful phone call, the worst I've ever had. And I actually, some of these thoughts came to me that day, where, you know, you're here because God wants you here. If you didn't matter, you wouldn't be here. The reason that you woke up this morning is evident that you still have meaning here. And I told her, I don't believe that any moment is wasted. I don't, I don't believe that you were just here because God forgot you were here. The fact that you woke up this morning, the fact that you are still breathing, and that some lightning bolt didn't just come and strike you during a storm or whatever, the, reason, the fact that you're still here, I mean, don't you think that means something? And I don't know if she listened to me. She said she didn't understand, but I saw her next week. She's still around today. Her daughter's about five years old now. Uh, I just see her in a parking lot sometimes. I'm kind of lost touch with her, but I like to believe that I helped a little bit and that she's still around today because of me. But, uh, Every day we wake up, we have an opportunity to find out what it is we're here to do. Every day we have the chance to worship, we have the chance to serve, we have the chance to live for God. And that's nothing to be taken advantage of. And I'm sure we can think of examples of people who do take advantage of that. You know, um, I don't feel it'd be proper to name names or to give specific examples. But we know there are people that just don't live the way they should. And that we could say they are wasting time. But even the centers, they're still here because they have a reason.
and you may be really good with technology, but you might be really bad speaker. And then one day you take a preaching class, and then arrange really hard, and your pants get really wet, and then you get up on stage and you start mumbling, but you hear it. I believe that you need to recognize your gifts and don't see them as coincidence and use it. If you're a really awkward guy or a really awkward girl, use that. People love awkward. <laughs> it's great. It really is. If you're a really sporty person or you like to go hiking all the lot, use that. Don't say that you're useless because all you're really good at is something like English. You can use that. My cousin is a missionary in China. She teaches English there. Right? And she has, doesn't have to. She teaches uh, Christianity to people kind of underground, not literally. Uh, she said she has to use code words and emails. And she has to like, be covert because the government there doesn't approve of it. But she's an English major in China, but she's also a part of the ministry. Any part of you can be used for it. Nothing is wasted, nothing is useless. You are precious. God put you on this earth because he loves you. And he wanted you to be here. You did not come into this world by coincidence or because someone made a bad choice one night. Everyone is here because they need to be here. And I believe that we all need to recognize that. And trust in God. Find our gift. And if you haven't found it, embrace what you are. And run with it. Let me tell you, I did not think that I would be up on stage preaching to a bunch of preachers. You know how intimidating that is? <laughs>